Peter Solovich. I'm a computer science professor at MIT. I also have an appointment in the Harvard MIT Health Sciences and Technology Program. And uh, we are now at the beginning of February 2008. Tom has asked me to talk about the history of my interest in personal health records, uh, personal health information systems, and in particular the Guardian Angel system that I proposed um, in 1994. Um, so I, I'm going to say things that are a little bit anecdotal because that's the way I think about these things. Um, when I came to MIT as a researcher, I got interested in artificial intelligence applications in medicine. And at that time, that meant the exciting problems were in things like uh, diagnostic reasoning, uh, therapeutic reasoning, uh, the repetitive reasoning that comes with uh, dealing with a patient with a chronic condition who might return over and over again uh, to the healthcare system. So my original interests were in things like um, how do you represent medical knowledge in a computer? Uh, what kind of inferences can you do in a computer based on that knowledge? Um, and I had always assumed that a lot of the IT functions that we took for granted as coming along in the future would in fact happen. So I remember in 1974 making a back of the envelope estimate that by about 1981 to 1983, the cost of keeping records electronically would be no more than the cost of keeping them on paper and therefore the entire healthcare system would switch over to electronic records which would then enable us to apply the kinds of techniques that we were building about reasoning about these data and medical models in order to build decision support systems to help doctors, allied health professionals do a better job of taking care of patients. So that obviously didn't happen. And by the early 1990s, I was under the influence of several different factors. One was that I had parents who were aging and getting a lot of experience with the healthcare system. My dad was born in 1910, so he was in his 80s. My mother was in her mid-70s, and both of them had various health problems. And so I had a chance firsthand to see what it was like to deal with the system. And at least anecdotally, the answer is it's terrible to deal with the system. Um, I remember accompanying my mother to uh, her general practitioner's office at one point where she walks in and he says to her, oh, Mrs. Solovich, how are you doing? And she says, well, you know, I was just discharged from your hospital a week ago, so obviously not so well. And he had no clue that she had been hospitalized or why or what was going on with her. So there's this tremendous discontinuity of information. And, you know, her neurologist knew some things about her and her cardiologist knew some other things. The general practitioner knew probably the least. Um, uh, various people at the hospital knew about her medications and problems she was having with those. It was just a hodgepodge and there's no continuity. So um, that plus some sense of frustration that in the research lab we had built a lot of ideas about how to do reasoning and decision support based on good data but we weren't able to test any of it in reality because we didn't have data to work on. And so I said, how do we deal with this combination of problems? And came up with the idea that what you'd really like to have is a computational process that runs for the lifetime of a patient or an individual, preferably from before birth until after the autopsy, after they've died. Um, and it runs continually so that it's constantly uh, incorporating new data about the individual, uh, and it's serving a bunch of other um, functions. Among these are a communication mechanism with healthcare providers, an educational mechanism for the patient, a decision support mechanism that helps the patient better manage their day-to-day -day care because they're not going to be seeing a healthcare provider every day. Um, uh, connections to other patients suffering from the same diseases, uh, connections to things like the National Cancer Society or Diabetes Society uh, for information and guidance and moral support in dealing with chronic diseases, um, 
and um, um, and it would be great if that could all be integrated. It would both be very useful if we could do it, and it also poses a tremendous set of challenges for computer science research, which of course I'm interested in as a computer scientist. So that was the origin of the idea. Um, I don't remember why I decided to call it Guardian Angel, but the history of it is that in very early 1994, uh, ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency of the government, was being viewed by the Clinton administration uh, as a potential MITI-like um, general uh, R&D organization that would help develop uh, future industrial productivity in the United States. And they went out and hired two docs as program managers, uh, Rick Satava, who's a surgeon, and um, um, John Silva, who I believe was an internist. Um, so they put out a request for proposals for interesting projects to do with DARPA funding. And we submitted a proposal, got, got it funded, um, and began work on trying to realize at least the technical aspects of this vision. DARPA, even by then, or ARPA in those days, even by then, was trying to make sure that the research they were supporting had some applicability. And so they connected us with a clinic at the Bethesda Naval Hospital where we were trying to work with uh, one of the nurses and a doctor who were running a gestational diabetes high-risk pregnancy clinic, uh, mostly not for military, obviously, but for their dependents, although sometimes uh, military soldiers would get pregnant as well. Um, and that project had a sad end, which is that in the November elections of 1994, the Republicans took control of the House of Representatives um, one of the first things they did was to pass a bill that renamed ARPA to be the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And I heard a story that the director of ARPA then gave a briefing to a bunch of people saying that he didn't want to fund anything that didn't go boom. So um, uh, we got cut off at the knees, basically, at that point. Uh, the history of the project then is that there were a number of young docs, like Zach Kohane, who had worked with me on putting this proposal together, and then a bunch of younger fellows, like Ken Mandel at Children's Hospital, who got very interested in this vision. But they were probably more realistic about how to get it funded in the long term than I was, because I was still interested in going for this whole ball of wax. Uh, we couldn't convince NIH to put money into it, because they said, this sounds like science fiction. On the one hand, and on the other, they said, oh, well, this is stuff that the commercial world is already doing in various ways. And so what eventually happened is that we did get some funding through NIH uh, to focus on just the medical records component of this vision. And that became uh, the PING project and then the NMESH project and is now the basis for the Indivo Health project which uh, is now working with Dacia, which is this bunch of employers who are trying to provide um, longitudinal lifelong medical records for their employees. So that's the connection uh, to the original vision. I'm still, of course, very interested in seeing the success of the shorter term haha uh, efforts and also hopefully uh, seeing the ability then to build on those records in order to create the kinds of additional capabilities uh, with which we started uh, as our goal.